Welcome back, everybody, to the ninth episode of the podcast. We're back on our every two-week schedule now that the NFL draft is wrapped up, but we've still got a lot of interesting stuff we're going to talk about today. We're going to be kicking off our NFL preview and predictions for this coming season. We're going to talk about the MLB seasons and possible trade deadline storylines. The NBA playoffs are in full swing now in the conference finals. Obviously, we had the lottery last night as well. And then we will be continuing our top 10 rankings at the end of the episode. So as always, of course, I am joined by Nick and Ader. If you want to say anything before we get started. Not much. Just got to be back after a little bit of a break and can't wait to get started. So we're not going to waste any time and we're going to get right on into it as we will start our NFL predictions for the 2023 season. So what we're going to be doing here over the next couple of months is we will be starting our predictions for this coming season. We're going to be doing it by division. And today we will be opening things up in the AFC East. So we're going to each give our thoughts on the teams and how they could possibly do. So I think we will start with the Buffalo Bills. They won the division last year. They're the favorite to win it this year. And for good reason. They've got an intriguing roster, but I do have some questions about this team I'm intrigued with the skill position, guys. I think James Cook, the running back, is going to take a leap. He was the guy I was quite high on coming out of Georgia. They added Dalton Kincaid in the first round. While their receiving group is a little suspect other than Stephon Diggs, I think both Kincaid and Dawson Knox had the versatility to line out in the slot when needed. Defensively, I do have some questions as well. Are you going to get a breakout from a guy like Kyrie Elam? in his second season. How are you going to replace Tremaine Edmonds? They do have Matt Milano back. He's really good, but they will be depending on some young guys to really perform, specifically at linebacker. They drafted Terrell Bernard in the third round last year. They drafted Dorian Williams in the third round this year. I really like Dorian Williams. I think he's going to be a good player, but for the most part, this is probably the best team right now in the AFC East. I would say the floor is probably eight to nine wins, like the absolute floor. And that's largely because they play in a good division. And the ceiling is a Super Bowl. I think this team could win the whole thing. Is this the Bills' year? I don't know. It felt like last year was supposed to be their year, but maybe it's this year. Yeah, at this point, it definitely feels like every year is the Bills' year. But both you and me kind of realized last year that they do have some holes that they were able to fix in the offseason. The pass rush was lacking, especially after Von Miller went down. And the O-line just was not it. And both of those got exposed in that playoff game against the Bengals. They were able to go out and get some uh, O-linemen to help that issue. They got edge rushers to help out a bit. And drafting Kincaid gives Josh another weapon so that if Stefan Diggs gets locked up, he has someone else to throw to. Uh, like you said, Don Kincaid, I like it. Gabe Davis. He has to maybe finally take the next step up. Um, but I do like what they have going on, not offense, but also as well on defense. Seeing what they'll do without Tremaine Edmonds anymore will be a big question, and I'm really curious to see what some guys uh, like Terrell Bernard, Dorian Williams, whoever they want to put in next to Matt Milano. But also seeing the aging uh, safety duo, Poyer, Hyde. I know Poyer just got extended, but I am curious to see how they perform, especially after Micah Hyde just came off a big injury road season. But I think about nine wins is probably the floor for them right here. I would probably expect them to be around the 12 13 win range more close to their ceiling but super bowl it's at this point super bowl or bust but i think they're they're going into the next few seasons thinking that and they need josh allen to kind of perform but at the same time you can't get out coached by zach taylor at this point so the team who finished in second place in the division last year was the miami dolphins they made the playoffs as a wild card team losing to buffalo with their backup quarterback And this is a pretty interesting team. A lot of things obviously depend on the health of quarterback Tua Tonga-Vailoa. If he's healthy, that drastically raises the floor and the ceiling because he's a whole lot better than Skylar Thompson. The offensive line still has some questions, but they have improved it a little bit. They just signed Isaiah Wynn like two days ago, so that certainly helps. And on offense, these guys have a literal track team. They drafted Devin A. Chain in the third round. Obviously, they have Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle, who are two of the best players at their position in the league. So if Tua stays healthy, this should absolutely be a top 10 offense, especially if the run game can take another step up. And if the offensive line is top 20 in the league, ideally. And then defensively, they've got some good players. They added David Long in the linebacking core. I think he's really underrated. 
They've got some good players up front. Christian Wilkins and Jalen Phillips are both really good. I don't think people give those guys enough credit, especially Jalen Phillips. I think he could really break out this year. And then the secondary is very strong as well. Obviously, they added Jalen Ramsey. So the floor with this team, I think, is probably six or seven wins. I think this team is too good to finish with double-digit losses, but it is possible, especially if Tua doesn't stay healthy. And then the ceiling with this team, if everything clicks, and if Tua plays like a top five to eight quarterback, I guess there is a world where the Dolphins could win the Super Bowl. So I guess I would say that's the ceiling. I don't feel confident saying that, but I suppose it is possible. Yeah, this is all going to hinge on if Tua can stay healthy. Before his first big injury last season, he looked like a top eight QB at worst, and he was phenomenal. He had the comeback against the Ravens through six touchdowns, and now he's going to come back fully healthy. He's got pretty much the exact same offensive skill positions. Um, they lost their tight end, who Mike Jacecki, that's his name. Um, but they don't use tight ends very often, so I'm not worried about that when you have guys like Tyreek, Jalen Waddle, Cedric Wilson, Chosen, Anderson. I think it's going to be receivers galore. You have the speed demon of Raheem Mostert that you drafted Devin Ashane, Akane, I don't know. And the O-line looks like it's getting better. And the defense, I think, also got the biggest acquisition for this team in getting Vic Vangio to be your defensive coordinator. You unite him back with Bradley Chubb, who, when you traded for him, looked disappointing. But his best season was when he was with Vic Vangio, with having 13 sacks as a rookie. So you pair Chubb with Vic Vangio, pair what looks to be an aging Xavier Howard with him. You got Sean Elliott, Javon Holland, Jalen Ramsey with Vic Vangio. That looks terrifying. I, if this defense can step up to be top 20, like you said, this team will, should probably make the playoffs. And if Tua is able to stay healthy and performs at a top 10-ish level, they probably have what it takes to make the Super Bowl. I don't think it's going to happen. That's definitely their ceiling is that Super Bowl. I think a realistic chance would be more around 11-ish wins, make the wild card, maybe win a playoff game or two. But I don't think they're going to go that far. The only person with playoff experience just is Tyreek and Jalen Ramsey, and that's about it. So next up, we'll take a look at the New England Patriots, who appear to be on the decline with their dynasty. But it's hard to bet against a Bill Belichick team. He's still one of the best coaches in the league there are plenty of questions about this team they didn't seem all that sold on mac jones after he had a disappointing season last year but they're sticking with him they added some weapons with mike gusecki juju smith schuster and then i thought they had a solid draft christian gonzalez is a guy who i think could be really good pretty early on in their secondary bill belichick does have a good track record of developing physical players in the secondary and i think this is all around a solid roster they do lack star power but they also don't have a ton of major holes. I think the floor with this team is probably five or six wins, last place in the division, and everything is falling apart. Time to get a new quarterback. The ceiling with this team, I don't think they can win a Super Bowl, but probably 11 or 12 wins, maybe win a playoff game, and that is if Mac Jones looks like a top 10 quarterback in the league or even plays a little bit above how he did as a rookie. I know it feels weird saying that a Bill Belichick team on paper is probably the worst team in this division, but they probably are. Yeah, this team definitely feels like they're going to be last in the division, barring some sort of crazy injuries to the other three teams in this division. But like you said, they don't have a lot of star power. The, the biggest name guy here is probably Juju. And he, with Patrick Mahomes, he was fine. But now he downgrades to Mac Jones, so you don't know what exactly he's going to do. But getting Mac Jones a good, reliable weapon is going to help him a lot into developing. Uh, number two, you got Devontae Parker. Yeah. And Tyquan Thornton is the receiver three right now. He's fast. That's about it. Uh, the O-line, good as always. I don't have any doubt that that is going to be good. Hunter, Ren Hunter Henry and Mike Jusecki running that two tight end set that Bill Belichick loves. And getting Mac Jones away from Matt Patricia is probably the biggest thing that they have done this year. Uh, you get Bill O'Brien back, who I think as a coach is good. I think he's a good OC. I think he's a good hire for them. And hopefully he can help Mac Jones develop. Just don't let him near any roster moves or else your team will become awful. The defense, again, doesn't have a lot of star power. Jonathan Jones was sneaky good last year. Josh Uche 
a guy who had double digit sacks surprisingly he was pretty good last year and people don't really realize that and Matt Judon another guy who the defensive player of the year stand out and I would not be shocked if he continues what he was doing pairing alongside with Josh Uche and like you said Gonzo loved the pick up there helping out Jonathan Jones but they don't have the star power to be able to do it. Maybe Bill Belichick can muster up double digit wins, sneak into a wild card. I don't think it happens. I'd put them around seven ish wins. I don't think it's going to be the greatest year for them. But maybe you suck enough to go get Caleb Williams. And then the last and probably most interesting team in this division is the New York Jets. And other than my own team, I would say the team right now in the NFL who I'm most intrigued about is the Jets. I really like the way they've built up this roster, and I've been high on this team since early last season when they drafted Sauce Gardner and Garrett Wilson, who were two of my favorite players in the 2022 class, and both guys even exceeded my very high expectations for them. The ceiling with this team is the Super Bowl. Aaron Rodgers has shown that he can do it. He's still one of the better quarterbacks in the league without a doubt, and I think they had the roster to do it. But I think the floor with this team is also quite low because there are a lot of question marks. Aaron Rodgers is 39 years old and he showed some decline last year. So will he be able to play at that Aaron Rodgers level or is he going to continue going down? Brees Hall coming off a big knee injury. At receiver, other than Garrett Wilson, you have some question marks with Alan Lazard and McCole Hardman. The offensive line, a lot of question marks. How is Mekhi Becton going to do? Defensively, Quentin Williams seems to want a new contract and the Jets seem hesitant on paying him for whatever reason. So if that situation turns into a big deal, then that could be pretty bad too. So I think the floor with this team is five wins. Aaron Rodgers goes crazy. Quentin Williams gets out of here. Makai Becton doesn't work out. Brees Hall loses a step. I don't think all that will happen, but there's a world where it does. And again, obviously the ceiling with this team is a Super Bowl. So I'm kind of rooting for him because I like the roster, but it feels weird rooting for Aaron Rodgers. But I think this team has the talent to get there. Yeah, I definitely think this team is going to be, eh, I don't want to say better than most people think, because I think a lot of people are going to say they're going to make the playoffs, maybe win the division. But it all hinges around what Aaron Rodgers can do. He has a new offensive coordinator, not just for him, but for the team after um, Mike LaFleur got fired last year. And but he's able to get more weapons. Gary Wilson looks really good. Brees Hall is good. We'll have to see what happens after his injury. He's used to Alan Lazard. He knows what he can do. McCall Harmon doesn't have to be the number two guy. He's the number three guy on there for the deep ball. And we already know, even at this age, Rogers loves the deep ball. And Corey Davis, Randall Cobb, some guys that maybe can step up a bit. Tight end, I think they have some good guys. Tyler Conklin, and CJ Ozoma. And the O-line is going to be the big question, I think, along with Rodgers. They weren't able to get a tackle into this draft. And Mekhi Becton is a big question mark. I think he's going to be able to come back to that rookie form that he had. Because as a rookie, he looked really good. Got hurt. Was hurt last year. He's kind of like Zion Williams. He was overweight as hell. But he's lost a lot of weight this year. He looks great. I really want to see what he's able to do if he can stay healthy. But I think giving a guy like Aaron Rodgers such a great defense behind him is going to help him a lot with green bay for so, drafting so many defense players in the first round it wasn't all that great the past last few years last time he had a top 10 defense Aaron Rodgers won the super bowl am i saying he's going to do it this year no but what i am saying is having a good defense will win his championships and i think getting a guy like Aaron Rodgers to help out that defense to not always be on the field is going to help you win games so that's our preview for the AFC East, probably the most talented division in the league. I think comfortably you can say three of those teams are certainly playoff caliber, and none of those teams are really awful. So there's a real shot we see probably three teams in that division make the playoffs, depending on how the rest of the loaded AFC turns out. But with that, we're going to switch our attention to the MLB season. We're now a month and a half in, and we can really finally start to make some conclusions. Now that we are in the middle of May, I think this is the point of the year when we can really start to actually make real conclusions about where certain MLB teams and players are. But before that, we are going to take a look at some potential trade candidates. This free agency class on paper, minus Shohei Otani, is going to be pretty weak. But there are some interesting names who could be on the move. Obviously, Shohei Otani is the big one. 
if the Angels are not contending for anything by the end of July, I think they would be smart to at least inquire. And if they're not sure they're going to bring Shohei back, they should probably look to move him because I think even with him being a two-month rental, you would be able to get the house for him. The Angels could rebuild their entire team. But there are some other potential interesting players who could be on the move. We're going to look at two hitters and pitchers each. I think Tyler O'Neill with the Cardinals is an interesting one. He is signed through 2024, but the Cardinals do have some good outfielders already. Dylan Carlson, Lars Newtbar, Jordan Walker can play the corners. And there have been some tension with O'Neill and the team, so I think a trade would potentially make a lot of sense for both sides. Another guy who I think could be on the move is CJ Krohn with the Rockies. He's a free agent at the end of the year. He's probably their best hitter, him or Chris Bryant. Krohn's a good player, and I think the Rockies could get a solid prospect out of him. So I think they would be wise to consider that. And then looking at some pitchers, I think Brandon Woodruff and Corbin Burns are two names to watch in Milwaukee. Burns in specific, again, it seems like there was some tension with Burns in the team. So I think that is very possible. And then another name to look out for, in my opinion, is Lucas Giolito with the White Sox. He's a free agent at the end of the year. Giolito's had a very up-and-down career, but he has shown the flashes of being a really good pitcher. So I think you could get a solid prospect or two in return, assuming the White Sox remain pretty bad. Yeah, I mentioned Lucas Giolito. I think that entire White Sox team could pretty much be traded with how bad they've been playing right now. But the one I wanted to mention specifically was Luis Robert. He's probably their best hitter, and he had that one ugly play a few weeks ago, but I still think he's probably their best hitting player, and you could trade him to a team that looks to get some more star power. Maybe the Yankees, they'd do things like that. And you could probably get a haul for him. Uh, and then speaking of the Yankees, uh, one of the infield guys, DJ LeMahieu, he's getting older. The infield for the Yankees isn't all that great besides first base. You have Volpe playing short, starting to get better. But second base is a bit of a question mark. Third base is a bit of a question mark. But I think if you can, they're probably going to want to go out and go get someone to fill one of those holes. I don't know who it would be, but I feel like if they are able to do that, DJ LeMahieu would just be out the door. And then looking at pitchers for starters, I really like the idea of the Tigers trading Eduardo Rodriguez. He has the second lowest ERA right now at a 1.57. He's been looking great this year after having an injury riddle last year. So getting a trade for a guy who looks really good right now from the Tigers who are uh, not very good uh, would definitely help them out for their future. And then another older guy, uh, Roldis Chapman, who out of nowhere is throwing 103 again for whatever reason. He's been playing well for the Royals. The Royals suck. And it feels like pretty much every team's bullpen looks awful right now. So I wouldn't be surprised if a team that's contending for a World Series would want to go out and get Chapman just to have someone else in that bullpen to kind of help him out a little bit. So as I kind of hinted at earlier, we're getting close to the one-third mark in the year. So again, we can really start to make some conclusions about this team, these teams. And seeing how the first month or so went, there are some teams who have continued to play really well or really badly. Look at the Rays, who continue to look like the best team in baseball. And on the flip side, you have teams like the Cardinals, who continue to look awful. There are some good teams who are surprisingly not performing well. The Cleveland Guardians are under 500, and they're in third place in, by far, the worst division in baseball. The Phillies are under 500. The New York Mets are a total disaster. The Padres are under 500 as well. So I think those teams, most of them will certainly clean things up. So it'll be interesting to see if that actually happens or not. And then some teams who started hot who haven't been as good. Obviously, the Pirates are the main one. They were one of the darlings of the first month of the year. And now they look like the Pittsburgh Pirates again, which is kind of unfortunate. Uh, the Cubs were playing kind of well early. Now they don't look great. The Diamondbacks have kind of come back down to earth, but they still look like they could contend for a wild card spot. I'm still pretty high on them. I imagine you are as well. So I'm curious to see if Arizona is going to be able to keep it going through the rest of the year. They are currently second place in the West. I assume the Padres will eventually pass them, but Arizona's a strong team. 
Yeah, looking at specifically those teams that are kind of underperforming, I feel like almost all of them will be able to pick it up. I'm sure the Guardians will kind of figure something out. The AL Central is weak enough. They'll get a bunch of free wins from almost every team in there. And the, But the team I want to look at specifically is the Cardinals. They have been uh, abysmal. Nolan Arnano has been really bad. Goldschmidt has been fine, but after winning MVP, he should be playing a lot better. And the pitching has just been atrocious for them. It's been so bad that they, after just paying Wilson Contreras 80-something million dollars for five years, they benched him to put him in the outfield because he was not good enough to play catcher for them. So that is really bad. And when you have a team like the Reds in the division who are higher than you and are tied with the Cubs and you're below all of them, there's an issue after you just won the division the past two three years and i don't i don't know what this future is because they're an older team their only good prospect is jordan walker and nolan gorman and that's about it they sent walker down gorman's in mlb but he's not doing all that great they've been just a train wreck this year and we talked about trade candidates before if they continue to suck they might pull a 2021 chicago cubs paul goldschmidt might be out the door they might trade Nolan Arnato if they're want, ready to go all the way. I don't know. I doubt that happens. But there's definitely a red button, and everyone in that building is looking at it, and they want to hit that bad. So now we're going to shift our focus to the NBA with the conference finals and the lottery starting up last night. We have four teams left to go in the NBA playoffs. We have made it to the conference finals. The second round was really exciting. All four series ended up going six games. We had the Celtics and Sixers end up going seven games. Game seven, not the most competitive. But now we're down to four. The Nuggets won a really exciting game one against the Lakers in the West. And then the Celtics and Heat will be kicking off, I believe, tonight. So I think both of those series should be really interesting. In the West, I think the Lakers could absolutely make the finals. I like the way their roster is constructed. I thought they did a great job at the deadline. But I have a hard time betting against the Denver Nuggets right now. They look like a well-boiled machine. Nikola Jokic looks like the best player in the world right now. He deserved to win the MVP this year, and he is proving it here in the playoffs. So I think I would bet on Denver to win that series, but I think the Lakers will make things interesting. And then in the Eastern Conference, everybody seems to be very confident in Boston. I think ESPN said the Celtics have like a 97% chance to win the series. That feels way too high, even though I think Boston probably does win the series. I think Miami has a higher than 3% chance. I mean, we saw them beat the number one seeded Bucks in, what, five games? Jimmy Butler has been obviously fantastic in the playoffs, and... It's hard to bet against them with how well he has been playing. I still think the Celtics win that series, but I think Miami is going to make it tough on them, just as they have with the Bucks and the Knicks. Yeah, looking at that Eastern Conference, I think Julian Butler has probably been the best player in the playoffs out of specifically that conference. But after my team lost to the Celtics in seven, seeing how that we were able to bring it to seven, it should have been quicker than that. But... Jason Tatum was not all that good until the last five quarters of the entire series. He was really bad the first couple of games. He was letting everyone else kind of do the, what he was doing. Jalen Brown looked a lot better than him. And people were questioning, is, is he who he is? Is he that guy? He made the comeback happen in game six. And then game seven, he put up 50 and our team blew it. But the point being, there was an easier way to stop Tatum and they were if we can bring it to seven against the Celtics I think the Heat could definitely bring it to seven they beat the Bucks they beat the Knicks they've been pretty much I don't want to say unstoppable but they've as an eight seed gone to the Eastern Conference Finals they should not be just underdogs they should they're probably the underdogs but they shouldn't be just thrown out of the conversation I, I'm going to pick the Heat because everyone's throwing them under the bus. And I think Jimmy Butler is going to carry this Heat's roster back to the finals. And I don't think it's going to be re rematch like the bubble year. I think the y Nuggets and Jokic are going to finally get it done. Anthony Davis uh, got bullied in game one. Jokic was a rebounding monster. He had more rebounds at half than the entire Lakers did. 
and LeBron didn't look all that great. They they played fine, but Jokic has just been a different beast, and Jamal Murray has been stepping up in the playoffs. I think the Nuggets are just too good right now to be stopped by the Lakers. I'm going to pick the Nuggets, and then I, I'm going to pick them for the finals. I think they're clearly the favorite, and I think they're going to be able to do it. Yeah, I forgot to mention the team who I have winning the whole thing. I think Boston is the favorite according to Vegas, but I'm going to pick Denver. I really like the Nuggets as well, so I'm going to roll with them too. We also had the NBA draft lottery last night. Not so much fun for Pistons fans like myself. Everything up until the fifth pick held the form. I kind of had a feeling one or two teams who were projected to pick in the late lottery would jump up, and that did not happen. It was all chalk until the fifth pick, which obviously ended up being the Pistons, who had the technically best odds to get the number one pick. They fell as low as they could go. The Pistons were not the only loser, though. The Rockets dropped from two to four, and it is a three-player draft at the top with Victor Wembanyama, Scoot Henderson, and Brandon Miller. So the Rockets... They got screwed as well. Not as bad as Detroit, but they they fell hard. At the top of the draft, obviously, we had the San Antonio Spurs get the number one pick. They will get to select Victor Wembanyama. I think for Victor, this was about as good of a landing spot as you can ask for. Greg Popovich has coached David Robinson and Tim Duncan into Hall of Famers. So I think he will very much enjoy being able to coach Victor Wembanyama. Greg Popovich isn't going to be there forever, though. But to have him coaching Wemby in his early years... I think that's going to be really good. So it seems like Victor was really happy with the results last night. And if I was him, I would be too. The Charlotte Hornets got the second pick. And then the Blazers got the third pick. So Charlotte's got an interesting dilemma at two. Do you go with Scoot Henderson or Brandon Miller? I think the gap between Scoot and Miller is big enough to where it does not matter who's picking at two. They should pick Scoot. I think him and LaMelo maybe will be able to make things work. And even so, you do not draft for fit over value in the NBA draft. Look at the Golden State Warriors a few years ago. They drafted for fit when they picked James Wiseman over LaMelo Ball, and I think it's fair to say they regret that. Portland at three could be interesting. They will have whoever is left of Scoot and Brandon Miller. That would be a good pick for them if they keep the pick, but I'm not entirely sure they will. I think they could be potentially shopping that pick, trying to get a proven player to help them contend for a championship with Damian Lillard still on the roster. Other than maybe Joel Embiid, I'm not entirely sure who they'd be all super interested in with that pick. And I don't think Joel Embiid will be available. He could be, but I kind of doubt it. So unless somebody like Mikael Bridges is available from Brooklyn, I don't really think the Blazers have a great opportunity to make a move. But I think, again, we will see Vic, Scoot, and Miller in that top three in some order. And then after that, the talent level declines. I think the next group of players features... Both of the Thompson twins, particularly Amen Thompson from the Overtime Elite, Cam Whitmore from Villanova, Jarris Walker from Houston. I think that's that next level of players who Rockets and Pistons fans are going to have to deal with instead of some of these generational talents. Yeah, on previous episodes of this podcast and like minutes before the lottery happened, I was saying I think Wemby is just the most prototypical spur I've ever seen. We've seen Tim Duncan, David Robertson. Why not Wemby's next? I don't see why not. And look what happened. It was destiny. It was destiny for Pop to get another generational talent at the center position. And it's going to happen. And I think Wemby not just is the best player, but I think he fits really well into this young core that San Antonio has. And if they want to go spending a little bit, then I don't see why not. There's not too many big names. The biggest name I can think of off the top of my head is like Kyrie or James Harden. I don't know if you want either of them right now. But getting another player to kind of help out that younger roster, especially getting a guy that kind of meld well with Wemby, is going to be really nice for him. And then between the Hornets and Blazers, I think they're both going to get really good players. For the Blazers, no matter what, you're going to get someone that can play really well with Dame, whether you stay there and draft one of Scoot or Brandon Miller, or you trade the pick you would get some sort of really good player to help Dame out because they haven't really had anyone else to kind of help them out. Uh, you mentioned Embiid might get traded. I kind of want them to do it at this point. Harden looks like he wants out. He's He declined his option today, and he wants freedom to do what he wants. He wants to be a contending roster, and apparently we aren't. Uh, but I do think a team like the Blazers could be an idea to go there. Dame and 
MB sounds like a nasty duo. Uh, a little sneak peek to maybe another episode, but I do think MB to the Thunder could be a really fun idea, but I won't go too much into details about that. But like you said, it was all chalk until five. I feel really bad for Pistons fans, and including yourself. I really wanted to see uh, Cade, Jaden Ivey, and Wemby all on the same team. That would have been really fun to watch. But I do think Wemby was able to get a really good spot on the Spurs. Yeah, before we move on, something that I forgot to mention that you kind of touched on is how Wemby fits with the Spurs core. I think a lot of people are kind of thinking that the Spurs have nothing and it's a very boring team that Wemby's getting drafted to, and I really disagree with that. I don't know if there's anybody on that team who's going to be a future All-Star, but Kelvin Johnson, Devin Vassell, Trey Jones, Jeremy Sohan, Malachi Branham, all intriguing young players. So I think Vic gets to be the unquestioned guy, and he's surrounded by young, good role players. So with that, we're going to head to our fun and game segment where we will be continuing our top 10 rankings that we have been doing in recent episodes. So today we will be wrapping things up here as we'll be ranking our top 10 current wide receivers in the NFL, catchers in the MLB, and small forwards in the NBA. So we will start with wide receivers and I imagine both of those are going to have similar players at the top, but it is really hard to order them. For me, the top four can go in any order, but my ordering is number one, Justin Jefferson, number two, Devontae Adams, number three, Cooper Cup, number four, Tyree Kill. Again, you could put them in any order, and I really wouldn't argue with it. They are all fantastic and special players in their own right, but that's the order I have for now. Five and six, I think, are, again, interchangeable, but I have Stefan Diggs at five and Jamar Chase at six. I think those top six guys are unquestionably the six best receivers in the NFL right now. Maybe you can group Diggs in with that top four cluster, but I think he's just a smidge below them. Number seven, I have A.J. Brown with the Philadelphia Eagles. A.J. Brown's been a good young player with Tennessee, now ascending into a superstar with the Philadelphia Eagles. Him and Devontae Smith are obviously a fantastic duo. Number eight, this is a player who I've always known was good, but I never really gave him his flowers until recently. But C.D. Lamb is really, really good. He can line up outside, line up in the slot, very reliable, very steady, makes plays after the catch, and he's improved every single season as well. So he's going to get a fat chunk of change pretty soon, I assume, from Dallas. Number nine, I have DeAndre Hopkins. I still think there's something left in the tank with him. Oftentimes, when you see veterans traded for late-round picks, everybody always assumes the team who got the veteran wins because it's usually a half-decent player, but there's always a reason why that player gets traded. However, I think DeAndre Hopkins is kind of an exception. I don't really get the trade rumors with him. I don't see how he's only worth like a day three pick. That blows my mind. DeAndre Hopkins is still really good. He played really well last year when he came back from his suspension with questionable quarterback play. He had Kyler who didn't play like himself and then he had backups and he still looked like one of the better receivers in the league. And then number 10, I had a pretty hard time with this one. A bunch of players I thought about. DK, McLaurin, T. Higgins, both of the guys in San Francisco, Amon Ra, Devontae Smith, Garrett Wilson, a bunch of guys you can put here. But I'm going with Jalen Waddell from the Miami Dolphins. He was really good last year, very solid as a rookie as well. Him and Tyree Kill are a fantastic duo. And if Tua stays healthy, I think Waddle will be able to take another leap here in year three. Yeah, you mentioned that top four could go in any order. I would say the top seven, I think you can group kind of I think that is the exact top seven. You can kind of order that top four, top five, and kind of whatever order you want. But we have the exact top seven. Jay Jettas, Adams, Cooper Cup, Tyreek, Diggs, Jamar, AJ Brown. That top seven, I think those are the definite top seven receivers in the NFL. Like you said, that four goes in any order. Diggs, Chase, Brown, I think is the perfect order for that five, six, seven. Uh, and then going to the eight, you mentioned CD, CD Lamb. And then you threw Hopkins in there, and I am a believer in Hopkins. I think he has made Kyler into who he is. He's probably the reason Kyler Murray got that contract extension. Because when you watch Kyler Murray without Hopkins and with Hopkins, there is a big difference. I think DeAndre Hopkins is pretty much the only reason Kyler Murray looks like a good quarterback in the NFL. I'm the biggest Kyler Murray hater you will see, but I am the also one of the bigger DeAndre Hopkins stands in the NFL. I want him to get traded. I want him to go play with a good team that has a good quarterback to go win a championship because he definitely deserves one. Uh, number nine, I'm big on this guy. Even if he's in my division, Terry McLaurin. 
really love what he does. Kind of like what Hopkins was in his early years. Has not had a good quarterback yet. Maybe Sam Howell will be able to do that with him this year. But we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But I do really like what he's been able to do. And then at 10, you mentioned him. I'm a little, a little below on him with us uh, as opposed to you. But C.D. Lamb, he's been great. Another interdivisional guy. And I am sick of playing against him. He should have been an Eagle, but the Falcons wanted to pick AJ Terrell instead. And Dallas just took him from us. And we had to settle with Jalen Rager. But whatever. All right, so now we'll be ranking our top 10 catchers in the MLB. Catcher is not the most sexy position. You don't see a bunch of elite offensive players here, but catcher is really important, and there are some good ones. Number one, I assume we're going to agree, it's JT Romuto with the Phillies. He hasn't been as good as some of these other catchers this year, but this ranking is also not just based on this year, it's based on reputation. And for me, JT Romuto can do it all. He can hit for contact, hit for power, good defensively, and he's got some wheels for a catcher. Number two, I've got Will Smith. Offensively, he's been the best catcher in baseball this year with the Dodgers. Really, really good young player. And then another guy who's taken a leap offensively is Sean Murphy with the Braves. I have him at three. He's one of the best defensive catchers in the league. The Braves got him in a fleece of a trade in the offseason. And I honestly think at this point he is one of the three best catchers in the league. Number four, I wanted to put this guy higher, but I'm not quite ready to do it with Adley Rutschman. I still think Will Smith and Sean Murphy are a little bit better, but Adley's special. I think in a year from now, there's a good shot. He's number one. Number five, an older player, but I still think he's really good. Salvador Perez with the Royals. He hasn't really lost much of a step offensively. On defense, he's not elite, but he's a really, really good bat. I still think he's number five. At six, he's had a down year, but Alejandro Kirk last season was really good with the Blue Jays. They traded away Gabriel Moreno, who was a top prospect in baseball for a reason. They clearly believe in Kirk, and I do too. Number seven, Wilson Contreras with the Cardinals. Again, he's been a little disappointing this year, but he's still a really good player. There's a reason why he signed a $100 million deal, even if it's backfired so far. Number eight, Jonah Heim with the Texas Rangers. He's an underrated young player who's gotten better every year of his career. This year, he's taken another leap. Really good player. Number nine, I have Travis Darno, the second Braves catcher on the list. Technically, these guys obviously can't play catcher on the same day, so you're going to have one of them DH often, but Travis Darno is technically a catcher, and he is certainly number good, or really good. Number 10, I have William Contreras with the Milwaukee Brewers, first-time All-Star last year. Again, another guy who has DH'd a lot in his career, but he is listed as a catcher. A player I had a hard time listing off was Tyler Stevenson with the Reds, but he has been pretty disappointing this year, so I think that's going to be my 10. Yeah, like you said, we're going to have the exact same number one, J.T. Muto. He hasn't been the greatest uh, player right now for this year yet, but that's half of the Phillies team. But he is a top probably two defensive catcher, and I'm sure at some point he's going to take off pretty much the same way he did last year. Started off cold last year, but he'll, he'll pick, pick it back up. You mentioned you weren't ready to put him up there. I am absolutely ready to put Adley Rushman up there. I'm going to put him at two. He's, he's been a bit cold after the first two weeks he was hot. But he's picking it back up. He's hitting 280. He's part of the, one of the better offenses in the league. He's the other top two defensive catcher in the league. I am ready to put him at two. And maybe by the end of the year, maybe at one. But we'll see if my bias gets in the way. And then three at Will Smith, four at Sean Murphy. I think besides Adley, those two would be the two and the three, like you said. Uh, Will Smith is probably the best offense catcher in baseball right now. Sean Murphy is pretty much that second tier below Romuto as a comes as to all the round catcher uh number five probably my most underrated catcher i have on here travis darno i really like what he's able to do and you mentioned the braves had two other catchers i do think uh he was going to be able to kind of pick it up and do what needs to be that be that setting starting catcher number six all five foot eight alejandro kirk everyone loves this man he's just he's a great player to be a fan of I really like what he has to his game. He's great offensively. He's great defensively. I really like what he has. Number seven, Wilson Contreras, like you said. He hasn't been all that great this year. He got benched as a catcher. So maybe does he deserve to be on this list? Who knows? But I think right now he's good at seven. Number eight, a guy I kind of didn't think you'd really leave off the list, uh, Cal Rayleigh. I think he's been really good for a semi-disappointing Mariners team. 
and he hit he had two homers the other night. He's been really good offensively. It's been underrated defensively. I really like what he has. Number nine, William Contreras. He's got DH potential, like you said. Uh, but for a Brewers team that is picking it up a lot, he has been pretty good. And then you say you didn't want to leave him off the list. I put him on there. Number 10, Tyler Stevenson. It's the Reds. They're all disappointing. But Tyler Stevenson, kind of underrated. Probably the best hitter on that team right now. Uh, really good contact bat. And pretty good defense there. Can play outfield as well. I really like what he has in the bag. And there's that's my catchers. So now we'll be looking at the top 10 small forwards in the NBA. And as we get closer to more of a positionless basketball league, it is kind of subjective of which players are at which position. To keep things consistent, uh, we are going off of basketball references positions. They technically have LeBron listed as a power forward, but when you click into his profile, he's listed at every position. And I would say he's more of a three. So because of that, I have LeBron James at number one. I have a hard time dethroning the King here. I still think he's the best player at the position. Slightly ahead of Kevin Durant, who I have at number two. Again, he's listed as a power forward and a small forward, but on his profile, it says specifically with the Suns, he's been more of a small forward. So I have KD on the list in that second spot. Number third, I have Hemi himself. Jimmy Butler has been fantastic with the Miami Heat this year in the playoffs. No different. Playoff Jimmy is a different beast. Number four, I've got Kawhi Leonard. When healthy, he is still pretty good, but he has not been able to stay healthy over the last few years. The best ability is availability, and he has not been consistently available for the Clippers. This season, he didn't look entirely like himself when healthy, but he did show a lot of flashes, especially later in the year, that he is still Kawhi Leonard. Number five, I have Jalen Brown with the Boston Celtics. He is really ascending into a star-level player. I think there's a good shot that Boston is able to keep him long-term. There have been some rumblings about him not being overly happy there, but if they win a championship, he's sticking around basically forever there. Number six, DeMar DeRozan with the Chicago Bulls. The mid-range maestro is still a really, really good player, and I've got him at the sixth spot. Number seven, Brandon Ingram with the Pelicans. You could argue maybe he belongs a little bit higher. Really anywhere between five and seven with him is fair. Number eight, this might be a little bit rich, but I am buying the Mikael Bridges hype. He looked like a top 15 to 20 player over the last two months of the year with the Brooklyn Nets. He's somebody who dominates on both ends of the floor. And again, the best ability is availability. He has not missed a game in his NBA career, and this year he played in 83 regular season games. Number nine, Larry Markkinen with the Jazz. Again, he's listed as a small forward on basketball reference. He is a seven-footer, though. But he had a phenomenal season in Utah. Through the first few weeks of the year, I kind of thought he was just on a hot start and he would cool off. No, he did not cool off. He is legitimately that good. And I think he could continue to keep that up after winning most improved player this year. And then number 10, there's a few guys I thought about. I really thought about Andrew Wiggins here. But I think OG Anunoby with the Toronto Raptors is a really good two-way player. Excellent defensively. Solid offensively as well. So he's going to grab my number 10 spot. Yeah, like you said, it's it's becoming a positionless sport, and it's really hard to kind of figure out some players. As you were talking, I thought Kevin Durant was power forward. You said his name, so I threw him in there. Uh, but I will still keep LeBron at one. I think he's pretty much the the stable of that small forward position if we continue to have positions. And then you got KD at two. I think overall KD might be like, it's weird. I think KD's probably better than LeBron. But I still think LeBron's a better small forward. I, it feels weird, but it feels right. Uh, three, I put Kawhi. I think he has a bit of a better talent than someone like Jimmy Butler. But I do think, like you said, the availability is really good. And he hasn't been available. But when he's on that court, he even if he wasn't himself, he was still really damn good. And then at four, you got Jimmy Bucket. He's been great in the playoffs. Pains me that we had to let him go. We picked Tobias Harris. Over Jimmy Butler, why did we do this? But he's been great. Five, Jalen Brown, he's been phenomenal. He looked like the best player on the Celtics in the second round until that last game where Jason Tatum decided to become the best player in the world. Uh, and six, DeMar DeRozan, kind of back and forth year for the Bulls. He was really good and also really bad and kind of give and take, but he, he was pretty solid for him. I really like what they were able to do. Seven, I have Chris Middleton. I think he was pretty good 
for the Bucks this year, helping out Giannis, trying to get them to that one seed, and they were able to do it. Number eight, I am right there with you. The Mikhail Bridges hype is here. I think the Nets have a really young core. Bridges, Cam Johnson. If Ben Simmons can figure it out, maybe that'd be a nice addition, but I don't know. But Mikhail Bridges has been really good, not just on the court, but he's just a great guy, I feel. He's just a really cool guy. Uh, number nine, Brandon Ingram. I'm a little lower on him than you are, but I do think he is there. And I think if the Pelicans are to go and find someone to help out this young team, like with Zion and Ingram, he will be right there with them. And then number 10, Larry Markkinen. He was easily was for the Jazz, who we all thought was going to be really bad. And they kind of snuck into like a playing spot. They didn't fully get in, but they weren't too bad. All right, so there you go. Those are our rankings, and that'll wrap up the episode. Another fun show in the books. Next time around, we're going to be continuing our uh, NFL predictions. If you would like to vote on the next division we do, you can join the Discord server. The link to that is in the description. And before we wrap up, if you have anything you want to tell to everybody, uh, you can do it now. Not much. Just can't wait till we get to my division. I can brag about how high Roseman is best GM in the football. That should be fun. So again, make sure to like and subscribe here to the channel. Peace out.